It is. Great session. Well, it's successful around. Sounds like what? <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. here in Washington and to our over uh, 200 uh, participants uh, online from around the world. Uh, I'm Stuart Patrick, Senior Fellow and Director of the Global Board of Institutions Program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm delighted to be able to host this conversation on the remarkable life and enduring legacy of Dr. Ralph Bunch. Uh, Dr. Bunch was a legendary diplomat and civil rights advocate, and was the subject of a brilliant new biography called The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Bunch, The United Nations, and the End of Empire. The book's author uh, is no slouch himself. Um, Cal Rastiala is the Promise Institute Distinguished Professor of Comparative and International Law at UCLA, which is, incidentally, Ralph Bunch's own alma mater. Um, before he wrote the book, Cal was already noted as one of the country's leading scholars of international organizations and international law, and he has now added top-notch historian to his CV. Thank you. Also with us um, are uh, Professor Lise Morgé Howard of Georgetown University and my colleague, Dr. Christopher Schell of the American Statecraft Program here at the Carnegie Endowment. Lise is president of the American Academy of the United Nations System. She is a visiting scholar this year at the United States Institute of Peace, and uh, she is also a professor, as I said, of, at Georgetown University. She is a renowned expert on the topic of UN peacekeeping, among other topics. Chris focuses on the contemporary role of African Americans in US foreign policy, but his graduate work has also included research on black nationalism and colonial liberation movements in the Caribbean. Uh, in, in, uh, particularly interwar period, uh, which were topics, of course, that would have been very well known uh, to Dr. Bunch. He's also a graduate of uh, Bunch's other alma mater, Howard University. So we've titled this event, Ralph Bunch and the Making of the Modern World, to reflect a central theme of Cal's book, which is really um, the indelible role that Bunch played in the transformation, and, and an amazing transformation, of world politics in the 20, 20th century. And that is the transition from a world of European empires to one of independent self-governing states. That journey was often bumpy, as I'm sure we'll discuss, but it was also an essential one. Two other uh, related uh, themes permeate Cal's book, at least in my reading. Um, the first is Bunch's tireless effort to advance the principles of universal human rights, both in the United States and at home consistent with uh, the UN Charter and, um, more specifically, the UN uh, Declaration on Human Rights, which turns 75 years old this year. Uh, as Bunch noted and emphasized time and time again, uh, the struggles against racism, racism at home and abroad were inextricably linked, uh, with US credibility ultimately contingent on dismantling white supremacy at home at the same time as it was being fought to be abolished abroad. Um, this was a reality, obviously, that he continued to experience personally, even as he ascended the highest echelons of the global policy community. The second theme is Bunch's unique role in inventing UN mediation and peacekeeping, which helped bring order to violent conflicts. As you may know, the topic of um, peacekeeping uh, was one that, that is not really spoken to in the UN Charter itself. It was, in fact, invented, and few people did more to invent UN peacekeeping uh, than Bunch himself. Um, so there's so much more we can discuss in this book, and I hope that we'll be able to get to some of this in the conversation. Uh, some of the thing, issues that, that I'm very interested in are about Bunch's rise from humble origins to the pinnacle of the global fo foreign policy elite, about how he balanced the radical vision, and it was radical at the time that he was pushing for it, uh, of ending imperialism with the often incrementalist approach that he had to take within the United Nations and other um, organizations. And also how he reconciled his undying American patriotism, which is quite palpable in the pages of this book, with the enduring reality of Jim Crow uh, 
um, I hope we can get to at least some of these questions. Um, if it's okay with you, Cal, what I'd like to do is start by asking two or three questions to you and then turn things over uh, first um, to Chris and then Lise to, to offer their own observations on what is really, really an amazing book. Um, uh, I, I want to start with a simple question. Why did you, why did you write this book? Um, you know, it's kind of the obvious question, but what about Bunch was so compelling that you decided to write a 667 page? <laughs> it's a big book. It's a big book, and but it's every every page is packed with uh, with great nuggets. Well, first, thank you so much for for having me. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I first got interested in Ralph Bunch because, uh, like you, I have someone who has studied international organizations and especially the UN system for a long time. I've taught classes on the UN for a long time, so I was aware of him. Uh, and then in addition, uh, as was mentioned, he went to UCLA. If you've been to the UCLA campus, uh, I know there's some Bruins in the room, you know there's this giant Ralph Bunch Hall, uh, which I've had an office in for a long time. And so that got me a little more interested in exactly who he was and what his story was. Uh, so this was many, many years ago. I started reading about him, discovered that we had his papers at UCLA. Uh, and then over time, I started to think about a book that would enable me, and this was my, my goal, and hopefully I succeeded, to talk about some key issues in the making of the post-war order that would be told through his life, and that his life would provide a kind of um, scaffolding for that. The book ended up being even more of a biography than I anticipated, but it's very much a professional biography. Um, you know, I probably spent 10 pages on his early life. So it's really about his work at the UN, his work at the State Department, his work as a diplomat, um, you know, as a, as a kind of creator of, of the post-war order. So all of those things were really motivating. And as I got deeper into it, I became totally immersed in his story. And so it is a very, um, it's a very deep dive into his life, but it's an incredible life. So that was, that was sort of my, my evolving agenda over time. And um, I, I'm happy with the way it turned out in that sense. I feel like it covers a lot of things that I've, I've often wanted to engage with but hadn't had the, the right platform. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me, and I, again, I commend it to you, is the, the way that Cal manages to integrate and weave together Bunch's um, biography and his story um, with what motivated him to be both a, a major civil rights activist and then also believe that the United Nations, this new creation that he helped bring into being, and, um, and, and we can talk about you know, his contributions to uh, the creation of the UN trusteeship system, for instance, um, and, uh, and how that differed uh, in terms of what, the, uh, what, the, what the, the mandate system of the League of Nations that had gone before and how he, he kept pushing throughout. You get this impression of a guy who is constantly pushing um, things forward but also doing so um, within the constraints of, of, of the institutions which, within which he's operating. Um, you know, the book's subtitle re refers to Bunch as the absolutely indispensable man. And I guess I'm, the, one of the questions is, in what way was he indispensable? I mean, are there things that he did that he alone could have done by virtue of his talent and intelligence, by virtue of his temperament, or by virtue of his identity? Can you give us a sense of, of, of how, how he was indispensable and maybe some of the, some of the sort of pivotal points that, where you think that he, he made a difference by virtue of that indispensability. Sure. So, so first, just the origin of the title uh, is an incident during the Vietnam period where he is at the White House. Uh, Arthur Goldberg, who at that point was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., previously a Supreme Court justice, had uh, brought him and Utant, the Secretary General, upstairs to meet with Johnson in the private residence and not realizing maybe that Ralph Bunch had actually met LBJ many times uh, before, introduces him as one of the two absolutely indispensable men at the United Nations and then quickly adds, the other one is Utant. And um, <laughs> then later on, as I describe uh, in the book, they go downstairs and Dean Rusk, pulls Bunch aside and says, this was all in the context of Utant going up for a second term as Secretary General. And he says, whatever happens with Utant, you have to stay on for us. You have to stay at the UN. We need you there. Uh, and that was a message that many people were giving Ralph Bunch at this point in history when he was actually exhausted by a lifetime of intense work and travel, looking to get out, uh, to retire, to spend time with his family. And um, 
everyone is telling him, no, you're, you're indispensable to the future of the UN. You're the only person, and he was, in fact, the person who had the longest tenure at the most senior levels who could see it and do it all. So he was indispensable, I think, to the organization, to its success in the eyes of many, many participants. Many ambassadors uh, came up to him in that period as he was like discussing retirement and saying, no, 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 don't do it. But he was indispensable in a few other ways. So, so one was, um, I think he was really indispensable to the creation of peacekeeping, which I know we'll talk about, uh, which ends up being one of the most important innovations in the UN system. So uh, as some of you know, peacekeeping, the peacekeeping budget uh, is enormous, often larger, much larger than the UN budget in general. Uh, as was said, it is not something that appears in the UN Charter. So the word peace appears 50 times, the word peacekeeping zero. So. Uh, it's one of these inventions that's incredibly significant, and Ralph Bunch is right at the core of that process. Um, and then the second thing that, uh, Stuart, you mentioned in the beginning about mediation, this is not an invention of his. Mediation has been around for a long time. It was an effort by international lawyers in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt gets uh, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation. So there's many prior examples, but... Ralph Bunch is probably the greatest mediator of the post-war era, and he's also the person who shows, proves, that the new UN can serve a really useful function in mediating. And so that is um, critical to the success of the organization. Uh, it's critical for a period of time to the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, but it's also critical to his, uh, his personal and professional success, um, and it's what makes him a household name in the United States and really around the world. So, um, there are many other things he was, he was you know, essential to, but those are the ones I would kind of highlight. Yeah, I mean, it's really amazing when you, when you read the book. There's entire um, chapters on you know, the Suez Canal crisis of uh, you know, 1956, which you know, certainly was a pivot point for you know, the, the, the future of the British Empire and for France, uh, and in and, 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 and a situation where uh, Bunch uh, inserted himself and helped create a, a UN um, force for um, Egypt and the, particularly the, Sin the Sinai, basically, uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and, and I guess the Gaza Strip. Um, the other issue, I, there are other, there, but there are many other ones. Um, he, uh, he intervened in the, in the, when uh, the state of Israel was being born uh, in terms of um, you know, negotiating uh, uh, um, an armistice or a ceasefire uh, after, after um, uh, the war of um, 1948. Um, but I want to probe a little bit more on his lifelong mission of um, advancing uh, decolonization. Can you say a little bit about how his intellectual trajectory that led up to, um, you know, stemming from sort of the, the nature of the colonial world and the imperial world at the end of the First World War, how, he, um, how his thinking about the imperative of uh, colonialism and, 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 and the subject of race, frankly, it, as, as, as the center of so much of world politics, um, even after uh, the League of Nations was created, and how, and how he thought about why, why, why did he think that this was such an important thing to uh, demolish? Well, he first gets interested in colonial governance when he's doing his PhD work at Harvard. So he, he graduates UCLA, he goes off, he does give a speech at UCLA that discusses international organization in a kind of interesting prophetic way, describes something like the UN, but he's really not engaged in international affairs that much. As he gets into his graduate work, working on his PhD, he ends up doing uh, a study, very interesting kind of comparative study on colonial governance in French West Africa. What makes him really almost unique is that he actually does field work. He goes there. Um, he not only goes to Geneva to talk about the, this is about the league mandate system, but he actually goes to French West Africa. He spends time there, and this is crucial to, I'll just digress for a second and say, this is how he ends up going into diplomacy, because he's then, as World War II is looming, uh, plucked from Howard, where he's a quite successful professor, to come in to what ends up becoming the OSS. Uh, the Organization of Strategic Services, the early intelligence community, as part of the war effort, because he's one of the only Africanists in the nation. Um, but in any event, that's the beginning of his interest in colonialism. And of course, for him, it was both a professional interest, a scholarly interest, but also a personal interest, because he rightly saw colonialism as a race-based system, as an aspect of white world supremacy, and as something that he, he thought was 
both politically uh, unstable but morally wrong. And so it became part of his interest as an academic to think about imperialism and how it could be rolled back and to think about how independence would actually work. And so by studying the mandate system in the League, he was studying an early version of something headed towards independence, though it was really not happening with any speed. And then, as Stuart mentioned, when he becomes part of the team at the State Department designing the United Nations, the trusteeship system, uh, which is a sort of successor to the mandates, is his centerpiece. He really designs it, uh, and he spends a, a lot of effort on thinking about how to make it work better. So how will, how will independence actually be? Uh, be achieved. And throughout this whole period, he's very focused on the idea that, um, this is something he said many times, including at the UN, doesn't matter whether a place uh, was ready for independence. So this was a common theme, was to say this or that territory was not ready. Um, even Eleanor Roosevelt right. says that mm -hmm. about Congo uh, in 1960, not ready. Um, Bunch would often say, well, people are never ready for independence. We were not ready as a nation for independence. Um, but it was a moral and political imperative. And so he's always focused on that, trying to achieve that. And to a large degree, in his lifetime, it was achieved. Not perfectly, still not today. But incredible progress was made far faster than anyone expected. You, you began to anticipate the last question I'm going to ask before turning things over uh, to uh, my friend and colleague, Chris. Um, and it's about two dilemmas that are kind of related with one another. Um, and the bunch may have anticipated them and certainly experienced them. And the first really has to do with this sort of question of preparation versus lack of preparation for um, colonial independence. On the one hand, self-determination throughout the world was and remains a moral imperative. And it's also something that I think in the long run, my, from my reading of your book, is he thought that getting rid of imperialism would actually reduce the causes of war, right? So that's, that's true. And then on the other hand, in a practical sense, the European colonial powers did virtually nothing in many cases, and sort of Congo being the poster child for this, um, to prepare or work with the inhabitants of colonial territories to prepare them for independence in terms of sometimes their political viability, uh, sometimes their economic viability, and, and what have you. So the frequent result of this was instability and violence, and that was most obvious, I mean, in the case of Congo, and then obviously the justification, at least in part, for UN peacekeeping. The other related dilemma was that independence, particularly for somebody who, in some ways, Bunch was radical, but my reading of his, of, of your biography is that some, in some cases, he's sort of an establishment figure as well, too, and navigating that is always kind of in, interesting. But, but from a multilateral perspective, one of the ramifications of the independence of these countries was to very much complicate, actually, multilateral diplomacy to some degree. And I'm wondering how, and by, and by that I mean both just in sheer numbers. You go from a UN that had 50 independent countries in, you know, around the time it was founded to one that within a generation has 150, right? And then the other thing is the, the ideological diversity, of course, of that population of states uh, uh, becomes much more diverse. You know, reflecting the world as it is, but from the perspective of somebody who was a part-time, had been a US, U.S. diplomat, but also a U.N. official, you know, how did he, how did he um, uh, think about the dilemmas of you know the rise of the non-aligned uh, movement, etc., which certainly gave the U.S. fits, and but also might have given sort of a senior U.N. official fits too as well. How, how did he think about those dilemmas? Was it just you know, independence had to be given, as you said, because of, um, you know, regardless of, in a sense, nobody is ready, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a fundamental human right. Is that how he thought of that? And how did he, how did he think about the, the sort of ferment of the new, um, the new organization? Yeah, those are good questions. So I would say he definitely was, pra he was quite pragmatic. So you mentioned radical establishment. He was often radical in thought, very pragmatic in action. Mm -hmm. And so he understood from his field work, for example, in French West Africa, understood that what you said was absolutely correct, and maybe even I would go further, that oftentimes European powers, the Belgians in particular, um, repressed any efforts at an indigenous capacity to govern. They made sure there were only 17 college graduates in all of Congo when Congo becomes independent. They had a pretty good primary school system, but it stopped at that point. And so there were real efforts uh, to make sure that parties didn't have national identities and so forth. So when you layer that on the artificial borders in African 
colonies, all of this creates uh, a number of very serious challenges. And Ralph Bunch was open-eyed about that. What he thought could square the circle was the United Nations that the international community had to be a part of the process of independence. It had to be there to give technical assistance, to give governing assistance, to provide a stamp of sovereignty, which was very important uh, to these countries. Joining the UN was often their first act. Congo tries to join the UN three days before its independence. That's right. That's right. And so there's a real eagerness to get the imprimatur of the UN. So he understood that the UN had a certain power. Uh, and that it would help guide what he knew would sometimes be a rocky process. Um, now, you mentioned the Non-Aligned Movement and Bandung, uh, 1955, famous conference um, of what was then called the Afro-Asian Group. And so, you know, it's interesting. Bandung, I describe in the book how both Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General, and Bunch don't really seem to appreciate the significance of Bandung. Later, we understand that to be a big turning point. Um, they don't seem, in the public speeches and so forth, there's not much attention to it. Um, but he definitely understood that the General Assembly, in particular, was changing rapidly because of this influx. Um, he didn't always like the liberation leaders that came forward. So there were several that he found uh, overly, I describe it as they, they embraced a hotter form of politics than he liked. He thought they were demagogues. So Nkrumah, Lumumba, uh, these were people that he might have liked a little bit at first. He certainly agreed with the idea of their, their movements, but he found them to be problematic in their approach, that they stirred up discord uh, and, in his view, created problems, both at home and in the UN itself. Um, so, but, you know, again, he was pretty pragmatic, and this is what politics is messy. Right. Exactly. You've got to accept it. Thank you so much. Chris, um, over to you. Um, love to hear, um, we'd all love to hear your, your reflections and any questions you have for Cal. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, thank you, Stuart. And um, Cal, I think your work is a welcome addition to the growing conversation on especially African Americans and in the, in the engagement with um, foreign affairs and international relations. Um, in reading this book, I thought about even Frederick Douglass, how he was the ambassador to Haiti. And I say that to say where how this kind of speaks to how African Americans, even in wrestling with the domestic situation, still were able to think about um, uh, struggles across oceans, continents, and they weren't they were limited by just Jim Crow segregation. Um, and what struck me, well, there was, there's a couple of things. Hopefully, we have enough time. But I guess the first thing would be you described um, Howard University as an intellectual oasis, and then you even go on to say that. Um, uh, Bunch's decision to study colonial self-governance in French West Africa put him at the center of the single most dramatic change in the lives of hundreds of millions of people in Asia and Africa, which I think is profound. Um, and I think it also happens, I know he was a master's student, I believe, at the time when he was at Howard, but he, he makes a decision to study um, French West Africa while at Howard. And I was wondering if you could kind of just speak to more about um, what was this intellectual oasis? I know there were other um, uh, critical black thinkers, such as Elaine Locke, that were there. If you could just kind of tell us what struck you the most about that. Sure. Well, first, I had the honor of going to Howard yesterday, where we met. Yes. And uh, it was terrific to be there. Uh, and it was a really important part of his life. So Howard recruits him. He just has finished his master's at Harvard. Uh, and he's brought in. And you know, Howard's in this moment of transition where uh, you know, there had not been black faculty, there had not been black, a black president previously until Mordecai Johnson, as I understood it. And so um, Howard's in a moment of change and evolution, uh, and it's an incredible group of scholars that uh, is brought to the university. And for Ralph Bunch, who's a young, uh, early career academic, very early career, this is very formative for him. So he does go back and forth to Harvard uh, to finish his PhD. But I would say Locke, in particular, uh, is very influential on him. So Locke, Elaine Locke, had also been interested in the mandate system. He had been quite critical of the League of Nations, uh, calling it uh, a new code of empire. This was a common theme, including around the UN later, was that whatever might sound good about uh, efforts at independence or trusteeship or mandates, whatever language was used, these were really just cover for continued uh, European domination. And so while Locke had studied it, he had not done the field work. He had gone to Geneva a couple of times, but he hadn't actually gone into the field. And so Bunch was encouraged to go further, and Locke was one of the people who did encourage him to do that. So that provided uh, you know, a milieu in which he could think about uh, issues of 
global importance and race in a larger context, uh, as well as some mentors who really gave him guidance. So um, it was very important to him, and it's where he met his wife. There were many things that changed in his life at Howard, so a very formative period for him. Yeah. And just one other thing, too. There's another tension I think you do an excellent job of teasing out, um, uh, and um, Stuart mentioned this earlier about um, uh, Bunch's uh, patriotism. Uh, true American patriot, he believed in working within the establishment to bring about what we would consider at the time very radical ideas about self-governance. And I think this is a kind of an overarching theme with many African Americans is a commitment to American democracy, but still trying to um, think about it within the confines of you know, domestic uh, racism and within like a uh, colonial wor world order. Do you mind speaking about what struck me the most was uh, the Vietnam era, where how he believed in the UN and believed about bringing about decolonization, but still was somewhat conflicted with how the war in Vietnam yes. was going on. And, and even you talk about Selma and how he didn't necessarily really agree with Malcolm X, but still like, aligned with uh, Martin Luther King's policies and how he went to Selma. So I'm curious if you could speak more about that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great set of topics. I'll, I'll say quickly he was, he was absolutely a patriotic American and was, for example, eager to join uh, what wasn't even the war effort in 1941 before, this was before Pearl Harbor, he goes into government service. And he stays there for the remainder of his career till he ends up at the UN. So that's, um, that's a big part of his persona. He often would speak in his speeches about America as uh, he saw that we were a multicultural society before that word was really in common use, uh, and that we were a kind of signpost for the future of a lot of other societies. Now, he was clear-eyed about the fact that we had huge problems. He was living it on a day-to-day -day basis here in Washington at a time uh, when it was extremely difficult for him, for any black person to live in this city. Um, and while um, you know, he, he did it, he, he bridled, um, as I think probably everyone did. So he was aware of that, he talked about that, um, but he always maintained a focus on making America better by using its better qualities. Um, when you get to Vietnam, that's challenged even more. So by this point in his career, he's an, he is an establishment figure. He's won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's one of the most famous uh, diplomats. He's the most famous person at the UN for sure. Um, and you know he's on a first name basis with every president and secretary of state. So he's embraced the kind of Cold War consensus that exists, but then Vietnam really shatters that for him. Uh, and as you, as you alluded to, with regard to the civil rights movement, which of course he had a constant interest in, but during much of his UN career he felt he could not speak out. Uh, he had to be kind of above national politics. Um, but towards the end of his career, as he's encouraged, going back to what Stuart was asking about, as he sort of like uh, begged to stay on, he gives himself more liberty to get more involved. And Dr. King is the person that he is drawn to. Um, he and Malcolm X did not see eye to eye. You know, Malcolm X famously said, um, I'm not an American, I'm one of the 22 million victims of Americanism. That was not a Ralph Bunch sentiment. Didn't he so, also say, uh, uh, I won't do lunch with br with Bunch, or was it or something along those lines? That was that. Various people have been quoted as saying that. I I attribute it to Stokely Carmichael. Stokely there's Carmichael. others who have, who sometimes have said it's, it's such that's a that was, yeah, quote. Probably many people came up with that. Yeah, um, right. But that was a period where Bunch was seen as an establishment figure, maybe a bit stodgy even. Um, but anyway, Dr. King is the person that he is drawn to. They meet in Ghana at the independence ceremonies in 1957. They maintain pretty close ties, but they have this rift over Vietnam, um, in part because not on the substance, but because uh, King famously gives a speech in Riverside Church in 1967 denouncing the war. Uh, to be fair, everything that he says was eminently reasonable and in fact positions that Ralph Bunch privately held. Um, but Bunch, like most of the political establishment, saw that as a strategic mistake. So, so King is chastised in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Bunch is quoted as chastising him. So that's, they reconcile. Uh, they reconcile in time for King to come visit him at the UN before the spring mobilization, major kind of um, uh, rally in New York. But it's definitely a moment where there's some, uh, some tension between the two. So, um, so he definitely saw King as the person who carried uh, the right uh, spirit and the right strategy and tried to align himself as much as possible. You're welcome. Great. Um
uh, we we can come back for perhaps in a in a, um, in, in, a in another round if uh, if there are some other things. But um, Elise, um, please. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Stuart, for bringing us all here together today, and to Chris, it's lovely to meet you, and Cal, thank you for this really tremendous work. It's it's um, it was a pleasure to read. It is not a short book, but it was still a pleasure to read for those of you who haven't read it. But yeah, um, I highly recommend it. Uh, so you mentioned that I have three hats this year. I'm, I, I always have the same hat at Georgetown. Um, I'm a, a senior fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm also the president of the Academic Council on the U.N. System. And this year marks the 75th anniversary, as we mentioned, of both the advent of special political missions and of UN peacekeeping. So it's a big anniversary year this year, and um, ACONS is holding its annual meeting around those themes with both of the undersecretaries general giving the same, um, giving keynotes on those themes. So if you're interested in talking to me about that work, come find me. Uh, I have three kind of comments and a question mm -hmm. in good uh, professorial form. <laughs> um, uh, the first to do with imperialism, then a clarification about peacekeeping, and then a, a word about cooperation today. So for imperialism, um, uh, it, so it, it was really such a treat, actually, to read to, and to relive the end of that terrible advent in the international system, to really think um, through how, how imperial, and imperialism ended with the end of the cold, with the end of World War II, and of course, with um, in 1956, this pivotal year. If you haven't been to Ghana already, I just like reading this chapter about his trip to Ghana. We mentioned Krume, you know, 1960 is be being the big year of liberation. Um, if you haven't visited, we have a lot of students in the audience. I think if you haven't been to Ghana already, please, I encourage you to go. Um, it, actually, no matter what age you are, it's never too late. Um, to feel the weight of imperialism and to see in Elmina and Cape Coast the, the, the funnel places where millions of people were ripped from their homes over hundreds of years and funneled through these choke points to go to the Americas. That experience, once your eyes are opened to the hundreds of years that millions of people's families were being destroyed, it's really hard to close them after that. So. I encourage you to experience what he experienced in Ghana, um, to, to feel that and to understand the weight of imperialism. I would also note in my hat at, at USIP this year um, that Russia is engaged in an imperial war against Ukraine. The way, no matter what you think about NATO and um, EU expansion, the way Putinism views Ukraine is that Ukraine is a possession of Russia, that Russia has a right to control this population, that no matter how much Ukrainians want independence, they do not deserve it. That is the mindset right now in Russia. So even though we saw the death of a lot of imperial forms, it still lives today. Second point on peacekeeping. Um, so I studied with Sir Brian. I don't know if we ever had this conversation, but this Sir is, Brian. This is Sir Brian Urquhart. Right? Sir Brian Urquhart. So uh, um, Dr. Bunch worked for many years with Sir Brian at the UN, and he he credits Bunch with creating peacekeeping. And for him, it was less about the the armed troops and more about the ideas, the principles, right? That this that we're gonna be using troops for a different purpose, not to fight and win wars, but with three rules that distinguish peacekeeping from war fighting, right? So it's impartiality, that the great powers aren't going to participate in peacekeeping, that they will deploy with consent. So you have Egypt consenting and Israel consenting, right? So they deploy with consent, and then they use limited or no force. Those three rules dating back to 1948 still still are there today. If you go to the UN's website, you see um, that those remain the, the, the founding principles of peacekeeping all these years later. Um, final point about 1956. So in 1956, we're, if you think back to that time, it's the Cold War. We know we're in the Cold War. Dr. Bunch has this incredible feat which is he mediates 
a peace agreement. So the UK and France and Israel have invaded Egypt, the Suez. They want to possess their colonial possession. And the United States says, no, actually, this is no longer yours. This is the end of your, this, is, this marks the end of your imperial regimes. So we have this, and, and Ralph Bunch is at the center of that mediation. We have this happening in 1956 um, as one thing. We also have the Soviet invasion of Hungary. And everybody's saying, OK, the UN's going to end, obviously. If the Soviets aren't going along, then it's not. And we have the advent of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association. So we have the start of, of figuring out how to rein in peaceful atomic use and nuclear weapons. So in this pivotal year of 1956, even though the Soviets have invaded Hungary and they've said, we are going to possess you, we also have progress in the UN system. And that is a funny thing that we see right now. So Russia has invaded Ukraine. And at the same thing, at the same time, I can think of a whole lot of ways in which they're still kind of going along to get along. So we have, um, we have the Black Sea Grain Initiative, continuing hum humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan and Syria. It wasn't certain that that was going to continue. It, a lot of people were thinking that Russia would start vetoing. Um, we have a new mission in Somalia or a reformed, um, there's, there's some activity on Haiti, there should, Haiti, Haiti is another conversation. We have IAEA, IAEA investi investigators and Zap, IAEA, um, one of my colleagues used to call it the EIEIO. Not very nice. <laughs> but anyway, sometimes they're doing stuff and they are doing, <laughs> a reference to old MacDonald. Um, um, in Zaporizhia, in this big nuclear power plant in, in Ukraine, there are investigators there to, and monitors to try to make sure that we don't have a big nuclear disaster in Ukraine. Um, so it's not old McDonald's farm. They're actually doing stuff. Um, the UN's been helping with prisoner exchanges, the Azovstal evacuation. We still have 1,000 UN staff in Ukraine. Um, Russia has been removed from the Human Rights Council rightly sanctioned a couple times by the whole UNGA. So we have um, uh, Russia on the outside, but also still working on the inside. And uh, in my mind, the goal would be to get Russia out of Ukraine, but keep Russia in the system um, moving forward. Um, OK, but so there is a question in all of this. So we have some cooperation. We have a lot of non-cooperation haven't had a new UN peacekeeping mission in nine years. So the Security Council, it's not just this year, the Security Council hasn't agreed to a new mission in a really long time. Do you think, there are a lot of places where you could imagine there would be a, pe a peacekeeping mission. Do you think it's still possible? Um, and do you think UN reform is possible in general? I think a lot of people around the world think that this, it's about time for the Security Council to reform. So kind of big questions. Take them as you will. Would love to hear some other answers also. Thanks. Well, thank you for all of that. And yeah, I would say, I mean, first of all, on, on peacekeeping, you are the expert. But you know, my sense is that you know, it, it's striking as a kind of peacekeeping novice. It is striking to me that it has been nine years uh, especially given how peacekeeping was, I think, uh, I quote the figure of about four missions per year in the 90s were, yep. were authorized. So there's an enormous amount of peacekeeping activity in the 90s, a really high point. Even after that, it's still pretty, in the early years of the 21st century, still pretty common. So we kind of grind to a halt. Uh, so I don't have a good explanation for that. Uh, I hope that it's possible because I do think that peacekeeping, um, in part relying on your work, uh, has proven to be more successful than I think many people realize. And I make that case in the book in part because not that Ralph Bunch lived for most of this experience. He died in 1971. He did not see most of peacekeeping. But it was the thing he was most proud of that he would talk about um, repeatedly as his greatest contribution, not necessarily the mediation that led to the Nobel Peace Prize, but in fact the, the invention of the principles of peacekeeping. Uh, and, he, and I think he rightly understood, going back to some of the things that Stuart said about the challenges of decolonization, that this was a necessary, unfortunately necessary component to managing what was sometimes a conflictual process. Not always, 
but it sometimes was required. And so I think he would probably be saddened to see that it's still required, but would want to see that happen. And I, I certainly hope that we'll, we'll be able to, um, to achieve that uh, without many more years going. Uh, going by, but in terms of the Security Council, Security Council reform, this is one of the issues. You know, I, I teach this frequently. It's a long-standing problem. Ralph Bunch himself was uh, not a fan of the veto, for example. So one of the key problems with Security Council reform is if you were to add additional permanent members, which is a common proposal, what would that mean? Would you want to have more vetoes? There's already five vetoes, six if you count the kind of implicit veto of the elected members because you need nine votes to pass. So there's a kind of system that's already skewed towards stasis. Uh, adding additional vetoes seems problematic. On the other hand, there's no question that it makes no sense to have these five putative victors of World War II uh, so many decades later. Bunch himself always thought the veto was a mistake. Um, I think he probably, if pressed, would recognize that it was a necessary mistake in the sense that that's what was required to get the buy-in of the great powers at the time, to make something of the UN that was meaningful. Um, but he didn't like it. He didn't like it. And so I think he certainly would, would want to see that reformed if possible. Now, in his pragmatic mode and in my pragmatic mode, I do not think that that is actually possible. And so we face this conundrum that UN reform has faced for, I don't know, 25 years at least. Um, but it does feel like it, what can't go on won't go on, and I'm not sure that it can go on much longer. But I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that uh, Security Council reform issue. Um, you know, not for nothing has there been a so-called open-ended working group on <laughs> UN Security Council reform, open-ended open -ended, um, uh, for, for a couple of decades now. Um, and you know, there's only been one reform of the UN Security Council, as you know, in uh, 1965, when or was implemented in 1965, when you went from uh, a council of uh, 11 to 15 members, and none of those were, uh, were permanent members. It was fascinating that um, uh, Joe Biden, in his uh, UN General Assembly speech, um, for the first time in terms of U.S. policy, suggested in this last September that there be uh, that the United States was open to permanent membership or was in favor of permanent membership both for Africa and for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, now, bringing that about and cutting that Gordian knot is extraordinarily different, because, difficult because there are at least three different major blocks: um, Africa block, the so-called major aspirants block. Uh, and then um, this, the the, oppos the opponents of the of the uh, of the major aspirants, and so it's it's a very difficult um, diplomatic landscape. Beyond the issue of whether or not you can get it done, and of course I agree with you that it, you know if something can't last because it's gonna it's gonna violate all principles of legitimacy, etc., then yeah, it's gonna have to change. The the other question is whether or not it would make. Um, the Security Council be better at its job, which is another thing. So legitimacy and effectiveness may or may not be in the, not that it's being that right. effective right now, maybe in some tension. I, I want to ask a question um, and then go back and see if the, you guys have some more. Um, I, I guess the question is, how, if at all, did the onset of the Cold War affect Bush's um, uh, insistence on decolonization? Um, you know, in 1941, um, after the promulgation of the Atlantic Charter, um, uh, I guess 1940 or 19, yeah, I think, yeah, I think always 1941, yeah, I believe, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt said that he, he believed that it applied to all humanity, much to the disgruntlement of Winston Churchill. Um, things got a lot more complicated um, during the course of the war, uh, you know, when the U.S. was, uh, towards the end of the war, when the U.S. was trying to, you know, re resurrect France and re resurrect Britain as, uh, as, uh, as colonial uh, powers, and, and, and also, you know, snag a few, you know, Japanese former islands in the Pacific, right, as, the, as, as mandates for the United States. But it got really complicated when the Cold War started, because on the one hand, if, if, if colonial governments could, um, could prove their um, anti-communist bona fides, then the U U.S. was sometimes willing, as in the case of um, the Dutch East Indies, to throw its weight behind um, the colonial nationalists. But in other cases where that seemed to be less than clear, like in Indochina, um, the, um, the U.S. Uh, often sided with, uh, with the, sort of the colonial masters in this case. So uh, how did, I mean, did Bunch see things that same way, or did he, I mean, did he see it through a Cold War lens at all? Um, yeah, I know he he got you know, dragooned in front of the House Un-American Activities for totally specious reasons, because as we talked about, he was just a firm patriot and a believer in you know, the American, he talked about the American way of life, et cetera. He just wanted that American life to be something that, say, black Americans could share. But 
Uh, but how, how did he see this dilemma with respect to the Cold War? Yeah, it's interesting. The Cold War is obviously a huge part of the book. So, you know, I start, he's born in 1903, so there's plenty that precedes it. But in terms of his, his UN career, the Cold War begins almost immediately, and it's, a, it's an enormous um, dimension to everything that he's doing. And I think he saw, I mean, first of all, you write about the United States having a kind of conflictual set of impulses that we continue to have. So we've, we've portrayed ourselves, uh, FDR certainly portrayed us, other presidents have as being anti-imperial, um, always opposing imperialism. Of course, that's not really true. It wasn't true then. Um, the Philippines were still, literally, we still had a kind of traditional saltwater empire, and it's still not true today. So that's, that was always a tension, but it was one that um, enabled the United States for, for both, you know, I think, maybe good motives and bad motives to seek the end of traditional European colonialism. So um, the Cold War gets layered on that in a couple of ways that I think are impactful for Ralph Bunch. So first of all, the Cold War enables him to, um, to make a case, this is not directly on point to you, but maybe more to Chris, but it, it's important to the book, and that it enables him to make the case that the United States has to change its ways with regard to racial justice at home if we are going to succeed in attracting these new states that are emerging from Africa and Asia to our side. So that was absolutely essential in his view. Now, he was not the only one to make that case. So some of you know when Brown v. Board is argued before the Supreme Court, the State Department has uh, intervenes and so forth. So there are many examples in which this connection between the Cold War and racial justice were drawn. But Ralph Bunch, I think because of his particular perch, because of his personal experience, was probably uh, the maybe the first person, um, that's hard to say, but I'll say it anyway, uh, he was certainly the best articulator of that argument. So he saw that directly and he felt that that was an essential element to our success as a nation uh, in attracting um, all of these new states to our side and not to the Soviet side. And he was concerned with that, even though he tried to stay above the fray at the UN. In terms of the UN, it obviously impacted the process of states joining the UN. And so that also directly related to his work. So, you know, initially there was this concern, we can't have states coming in, we need to kind of manage the process. Then it opens up very quickly. So many new states are coming um, into the international system in 1960. This was referenced earlier, the year of Africa. He dubs, uh, he dubs it 17 states in Africa gain their independence. So there's a ton of new aspirants coming into the system, and he's really welcoming that. But immediately the Cold War is part of that story, most dramatically with Congo, where uh, Congo becomes the first African battle line in the Cold War. Um, Lumumba seeking, facing a civil war, what's essentially a civil war, is seeking assistance from the United States. He does not get it. Then there's a kind of manipulation behind the scenes. Can the UN be a part of that? That's good, but it's not. The UN forces, the peacekeeping forces are not doing what Lumumba wants, which is actually stopping the breakaway province of Katanga from breaking away with Belgian assistance. And so he then turns to the Soviets, uh, and that marks him in the eyes of the West uh, as, uh, as, a, as a traitor, in essence, as someone who is, uh, who is then, and then he's tracked down, assassinated um, with clearly the complicity of Belgium, and many would argue with the complicity of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all swirling around. Um, so it has, the Cold War has a huge impact on many dimensions. We're in about 10 minutes, um, or a little bit less, we're gonna open it up to um, those of you here and also uh, online. So please have, uh, have some, uh, questions in mind, uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, uh, I, I have an, another question uh, in, 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 that I'm holding in reserve, but, uh, but I want to ask um, Chris and Lisa if there's something else that you'd like to, um, like to hear from. Yeah, um, I think my question will come along the lines of thinking about Bunch as an um, establishment figure, um, you know, and thinking about his time studying uh, French colonial policy and just his ruminations on you know, European empire. You know, he was, as you've acknowledged, wasn't the only individual thinking about that. You know, there's, there were other individuals, I'm thinking uh, most notably Marcus Garvey, um, who came under, you know, colonial and, you know, U.S. assault. And I'm even thinking about, you know, Malcolm X um, essentially championed the Mau Mau movement in, in Kenya. So there, there were many other individuals who I guess one could argue were grassroots, more radical, that also fought for, you know, decolonization. And this kind of brings up the argument about 
um, agitating for change within the system, without the system. I think about that most notably, in that present moment, th in thinking about police reform. And this is kind mm -hmm. of like a domestic issue, but you know, can you really change a system from the inside? You know, is, is it rotten from the inside out? What do you think, I guess, in looking, using Bunch as like a window, what he say about you know, that argument between you know, how to properly agitate for change? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I do grapple with that in the book about how to kind of characterize his thinking, because you could say that he was radical in that in his earlier, I mentioned he was like radical in thought and pragmatic in action, in his career at Howard as a professor, his writings, like a lot of writings of that era, Marxist inflected, mm -hmm. often pretty radical, um, even by today's lights on some measures, but certainly at the time. Um, and then he enters government service and he becomes seen, and he was, more guided by pragmatism. So that part of him takes over. And in fact, he renounces some of his earlier work. When he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, the YWCA wants to get copies of his, his book uh, that was part of the series that Elaine Locke had put together called A World View of Race. It was kind of a short book. And Bunch says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I'm not proud of that work. And that was hastily done. And basically, let's forget about that. Now, that might have just been strategy that somehow he sensed the coming McCarthy moment and the fact that he would face a loyalty board. Uh, or maybe it was, it's hard to say what motivated him. But he definitely wanted to push back some of his radicalism. Um, in favor of working on the inside. He did really like, he never went back into academia. So he had many opportunities to do it. Uh, he kept getting leaves from Howard, but he also then had job offers, Harvard, Princeton, really anywhere he wanted to go. Once he wins the Peace Prize, for sure, he could go anywhere he wants. He doesn't ever do it. Um, and so you know, his revealed preference is for working as a policymaker. Uh, not as a theorist. Now, that doesn't necessarily perfectly correlate onto what you posed, but there's a close analogy in working within rather than without uh, the system. And so I think in his thought, in his writings, even in his own private writings and his diaries, he definitely evinced a mind that was a believer in uh, the essential trajectory of things, whether it was the international system, um, maybe less true there, because he wanted to see change, um, but certainly America itself as a place that he did not want to see radical change. Um, so I think he, he was always drawn to, when he, for example, when he goes to work at the State Department, he's working on the UN itself, he's so excited to see his writing, his ideas appear actually in print in the charter. That's a great moment for him. And he's like, I can't believe he writes home to Ruth about how great this is. So I think he generally was someone who liked to work within the system. Once he'd risen to the top, I think he found that very attractive, as frankly, many people do. You know, we're, we're a society full of people who, um, you know, I'm from the great state of California where uh, we already have a race for Dianne Feinstein's seat and she hasn't even gotten out of it yet. So, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are many people who find it very hard to step out of positions of power. Um, for, for numerous reasons, and I think he was one of them, and he found that really enticing. So all that said, he, 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 didn't, um, he didn't give up on some of his radical ideas, but he gave up on, he didn't give up on all of them, but he gave up on some. Thank you. As, um, this, did you have a question? Yeah, it's a final question. Um, I mean, and I don't know if it has an answer, but it, it would be interesting just to hear if you do. You know, so I, I teach about Dr. Bunch pretty frequently, and a, and a lot of my, I mean, over the years, I've been at Georgetown for 19 years, a lot of my students have never heard of Bunch. I mean, maybe now there are a few, but but it's very often they don't, and they haven't. They will now. I hope they will now. Um, but here's this person, right? I'm just going to recap, because I don't know if we got a full recap, but I think I can do it off the top of my head, right? So he's He's this kid, like this black kid from California. He's a valedictorian of his class. He goes to UCLA when there, there are like no black people. He gives the, the commencement speech. He's the first black person to earn a PhD from Harvard. Um, he, he's like the first, the first, the first. He helps to draft the UN Charter. He helps to draft the Universal Declaration of <coughs> Human Rights. He invents peacekeeping. He oversees the decolonization of the world, <laughs> right? Like this is somebody 
who is larger than life. I mean, like, you can't make this stuff up, right? I mean, it's, this is a life that is so extraordinary. Why, why, why isn't he, like, on the, the I don't know, why? The dollar why, bill. Uh, on the dollar bill, yeah. yeah like, yeah. why, you know what I mean? Like, what, never mind that he, we noted that he won the Nobel Peace Prize and, like, was the first one to establish peace in Israel. I mean, like, the, you know, if you go on with the list, it just sounds fantastical. So why, why do we not know more about him? I mean, it's obviously a question that I've really grappled with and been drawn to. It's part of the reason I, I wrote the book was to try to rectify that, though I want to emphasize it's not the only book, not the only biography. There's a lot of great work out there that many people have done and will do in the future on him. But it is absolutely true that he is not well enough known, even at UCLA. Um, you know, I'm always struck by my students. I teach in our global studies program. These are students who, you know, clearly I teach a class on the United Nations. They should know. And they know there is a guy named Ralph Bunch, but that's sort of it. That's about where it ends. Maybe the Peace Prize. You know, to explain that, you know, I guess I'd point to a couple things. So one, he, you know, it's been over 50 years since he passed away. So a lot of time has passed. Um, that doesn't explain it all, but, you know, that he was... He was so famous in his lifetime, the way I opened the book is at the 1951 Academy Awards where he comes on stage to actually give out the best picture. That's the level of fame that he had. Um, so it's kind of astonishing uh, today to imagine that or anyone with that level of, of success. So it is really surprising, but I think time is part of the story. I think the Cold War is part of the story. I think his seemingly magic touch with diplomacy was viewed as so essential to success during the Cold War. And then when the Cold War ends, like a lot, I mean, the 90s were an unusual time uh, for foreign affairs, but in this country at least, it's a time when a lot of people said, oh, okay, that's over, we have a peace dividend, we don't really need to worry about the international system that much. Of course, that is not true, wasn't even true then, but I think he then sort of lapses in the minds, um, in the minds of many people. And, you know, even by the end of his life, it was front page news when he dies, the New York Times has a front page story about him. But he had fallen out of step, uh, certainly with the civil rights movement uh, in, to some degree, although he was closely aligned as we talked about with Dr. King. Um, he was often viewed as someone who was too establishment. Muhammad Ali criticizes him saying, you know, Ralph Bunch is someone uh, we often see, but helping people somewhere else in the world, not working here at home. Not really a fair criticism, but one that many people leveled at him. Um, they saw him as, you know, he's off in Yemen, he's off in Cyprus, he's doing something else. So I think even within his lifetime, his star had dimmed a little bit, and he was seen as uh, someone who was not at the forefront. Um, all that said, I cannot explain it. Um, I think his life is extraordinary. I think it's fascinating. I've been, you know, immersed in it for such a long time, probably not, uh, you know, I don't have, I'm not a dispositive uh, reader, dispassionate reader, but. I really find it amazing. So I do hope that this book will help kind of bring him back to life for people. Um, uh, we're going to go to uh, questions now, both from uh, within the room and online. Uh, please, um, again, um, if you're online, uh, please be um, sure to submit any questions uh, that you may have. And um, uh, I guess I'll just open it up with, OK, Rick. Uh, please, and please, could you uh, state your name and affiliation? That'd be great. Sure. Uh, uh, Rick Barton, Princeton University. Uh, first off, could you just give us maybe one one video that we could go to that would give us a feeling if we go home and just want to get to know Ralph Bunch and with a little bit of the personality coming out that you've you've seen? Obviously, we'll get that from your book, uh, but it always helps to have that taste. And secondly, the UN is at the 75-year mark. Um, if he were looking at the UN today, what would be his greatest disappointment? I think the separate from the peacekeeping uh, stalemate, which is quite a compelling argument, uh, but also what would he, what would he want to? What would be his initiatives or reforms or or take backs if he had them at this point? That's a great question. So on the videos, I, I would say, I guess, two things. So one, you can go to the UN website. Um, I'm forgetting exactly how they characterize it, but where they have their photographs, their multimedia stuff. They have a lot, a lot there. A lot of still photographs, but also videos. 
and I recommend that. Um, and I want to thank the UN for giving me uh, permission to use those photographs in the book. And uh, there's a lot of great things. But there's videos there, too. You can even find on YouTube quite a bit. Um, you can even find the Academy Awards oh, ceremony great. where Fred Astaire introduces him and he gives a speech uh, before he hands off uh, the best picture. So you, you can find that as well. So that'll give you a little taste of him at kind of his heyday uh, of, of fame. In terms of the UN and what he would be disappointed by and what he might change, um, I think he would certainly be very troubled by Russia and Ukraine. Um, maybe not surprised, he tangled with the Soviets quite a bit during his tenure. Uh, they were quite obstructionist in the early years of the UN, extremely so in many ways. That frustrated him as a UN true believer. They also personally treated him as a kind of arm of the State Department. As far as they were concerned, he never left the State Department. And so he was often frustrated by that. Um, so I think he might not be shocked to see that uh, Russia was uh, a bad actor in the system in some ways, but I think he would be uh, really perturbed by, by this current situation. I think he would um, be, on a more positive note, pleased to see how successful the UN has been at growing. You know, it's when, when he, his dream in many ways was to see a world of free and independent states. That is mostly achieved by 1971 uh, when he passes away, but not fully. And so I think he would be pretty impressed to see that that continued on uh, and he would be happy about that. And also the UN has expanded in so many ways. So he focused on peace and security, but of course there's so many humanitarian issues that the UN is involved with that were just getting going. Um, so I think he would be pleased by that. Um, the final kind of note of disappointment might be we're not at such a bad moment right now, but American support for the UN was something that when, it's, when it starts to crumble, even in the 50s, when conservatives, uh, when the far right begins to view the UN as some kind of hotbed of communism, he is really disturbed by that. He can't believe that, you know, he was there at the creation. He was someone who saw that this was an American creation. Why would the American public turn on this institution that embodied so many values that he thought we shared as a nation? Um, so even in the 50s, he was troubled by the way Birchers and others were beginning to criticize the UN. Uh, but certainly if he had lived to see you know, the, the dues issues in the 90s, Jesse Helms, all these other, uh, the attacks, Donald Trump, many other ways in which uh, the United States um, was openly oppositional to the UN, I think he'd be really troubled by that. Yeah, presumably he would not um, be enthusiastic or he might not have been surprised, but, um, but would not be pleased by the the status of uh, Middle East peace after all these years. No, no, for sure, that's another one that, <laughs> he did say on a few occasions that he was amazed that the armistices that he negotiated were still, still being invoked free. in the 60s in the Security Council. And he said, I, you know, I thought this was a temporary thing and it's amazing. They would invoke him, you know, they would invoke those, uh, those armistices as if they were like a constitution of the Middle East. Right, sure. So he found that kind of amazing. But yeah, Middle East peace, obviously, uh, <laughs> yeah. would trouble him. Yeah, uh, for us all. Uh, Ellen, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Ellen Lapes in George Mason University. So perfect segue, because I wanted to dig a little bit deeper on how he managed the early debates about peacekeeping. Knowing what we know now, in hindsight, Rwanda, et cetera, we know that some of the you know, sort of noble principles of peacekeeping don't always achieve the objectives intended. So on two things, one is whether peacekeepers should always be virtually unarmed or lightly armed when you know you've got spoilers and peace is fragile and the peacekeepers stand there impotent when mm. the bad actors start to stir up again. So whether there was any awareness at the time that maybe they should be able to use coercive force or not, and then the second is, I appreciate what you just said about the armistices, that he thought they'd be temporary. What happens when the peacekeepers just get stuck and the peace process doesn't quite complete? I mean, Cyprus is the best example. They haven't, they still haven't figured out how to, you know, figure out the governance structure of Cyprus because the peacekeepers are standing there. So um, just any reflections on whether any of those issues surfaced at the time of the debates? Yeah, so on the first one, both, both good questions and, and interesting complex topics. But on the first, you know, he presides in a sense over, initially literally presides over the first Congo mission. Um, and then in a sense politically is presiding over it as it continues for several years. 
And that Congo peacekeeping mission is very aggressive. So, you know, the peacekeepers, while the earlier versions were maybe characterized as lightly armed, that was not the case in Congo. In fact, they're using air power at times. Um, they're taken prisoner. Uh, you know, there's extensive casualties. Uh, you know, vehicles are, it was all sorts of, it's, it's a war in many ways in which the UN is a participant. Um, and so he sees that firsthand. Um, he's not crazy about it in the sense that no one wants to see that happen, but in my read of the evidence that I saw, at no point does he think, you know, we can't be doing this. He does think we can't, ne we the UN can't necessarily be intervening in a civil war the way, for example, Lumumba pushes him all the time. Why can't you just go to Katanga and solve this problem? And he's like, we can't do that as a matter of the charter. But in terms of the level of firepower brought to bear, I did not find that he was troubled by that. So, um, so all, you know, all of that said, he wants to see peacekeeping be peaceful, but I think he recognized sometimes it required more. Um, then you, sorry, the second question. When the peacekeeper, when the peacekeeping mission is open-ended. Yes, open yes, so at one point before uh, the 67 war, he says something, I'm gonna paraphrase, but something about, you know, you can't pull out the peacekeepers, he, he, he sort of wrongly, assumes they're going to stay, they end up getting pulled out. But he says, you, who would want to pull out the peacekeepers because they kind of keep the peace? And then what happens when you do? That's going to immediately lead to conflict. And of course, within six months, that's exactly what Egypt demands. And the peacekeepers are withdrawn and the war commences. And in fact, they're not withdrawn fast enough. Some of them are killed. Mm -hmm. so, um, so he sees all of that unfold and he recognized that that was a deep dilemma. And he spent a lot of time in Cyprus. So he knew that Cyprus um, was one of the many examples in which it seemed to freeze a conflict. Uh, and, you know, I think in his mind, who, he was such a believer in kind of rational reasonableness. If you just get people to sit down and talk reasonably, you could solve any problem. I think he's still, he was such an optimist. He characterized himself as a professional optimist in a few occasions. In fact, in a speech in Cyprus, he, um, or addressing reporters, he says, I am a professional optimist personally pessimistic, professionally <laughs> optimistic. And so, you know, I think he always thought, yeah, we will solve this eventually. But you're right, with hindsight, not always the case. We have, we have a question uh, online here, um, which is related to the Congo um, issue. Um, uh, did Bunch's star wane, and this is from Pearl Robinson, did Bunch's star wane at the UN after the death of Hammerskold in the plane crash over Africa? Well, I would say no. I think, the first of all, just about the plane crash. Some of you may know Hammerschold dies in that kind of mysterious plane crash that's still somewhat mysterious to this day um, while heading actually to Katanga or out just outside Katanga. Uh, and so... Uh, Yet, one of two instances where Bunch somehow cheats death yes, by total nar narrowly averts. Uh, he's at the airport before they leave New York. Uh, he almost ends up on the plane, and he and he's asked to stay back, um, and and he you know he survives for that reason. Everyone on board is killed. Um, in some ways, he and Hammerschild had an incredibly close relationship, and they really um, they really saw eye to eye, to eye on a lot of things. And Hammerschild leaned on him a lot. I guess I would say he he maybe even grows in stature mm. because of Hammerschild. Hammerschild was revered and maybe sometimes criticized for certainly by the Soviets for being such a forward leaning secretary general. But once he, he passes away and Utant comes in, uh, it's not really clear that Utant is going to be the kind of, um, I don't wanna say aggressive, but bold leader that Hammerschild was, and, and Utant wasn't. And so the Americans certainly lean on Bunch even more in this period. They view him as uh, the person that has to stay. I, I gave that vignette about Dean Rusk begging him to stay on or practically ordering him to stay on because they, they thought that he was so essential. And so many people, I think, viewed him as the person with the institutional memory to guide the ship in a way that they didn't think Utant could or would. Um, and so, and Utant's coming in at a very difficult time. So it's not, you know, Bunch had respect for Utant. It was not that Utant was ineffective. It was that he didn't have the experience and he was dropped in at a critical time. Congo is going on. Um, uh, Vietnam is heating up. Cyprus is continuing. You know, all of these problems are continuing. 
And so Bunch becomes, in some ways, even more important. His star in the American public eye, by this point, is dimmer. But I think that more has to do with the, the symbolism that he had in the 1950s as a, um, in, his, in his view, he was frequently treated as a kind of token of progress. But as, as an example of racial advancement, um, that was something that, by the 60s, is less palpable. Can I ask what will probably be our last question? Um, and it really is bring, uh, thinking about the enduring legacy of Bunch and some of the lessons uh, for our, our current day. As you know, there's a huge um, a debate going on about um, diversity in uh, well, all of American society, of course, but not least um, in US foreign policy. And there have been certain leaders that we've had, um, Condoleezza Rice, Susan Rice, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, et cetera, a, a number of um, folks who are at the pinnacle of the US foreign policy and national security establishment, and Secretary of Defense as well, Lloyd Austin. And yet, there are continued debates over, or continued discussions about what can be done to, and the, and the val, first of all, the value of diversity in the US foreign policy establishment, much less within the United Nations system. Um, and what, what can be done, um, what, first of all, the, the benefits of that, and then what can be done to advance um, that cause. Does, did, did, you must have been asked this before in, uh, in giving um, talks about this topic, or, or have some reflections on, on, on what lessons, if any, a bunch teaches us about that. I mean, he himself, he didn't use the language of diversity because that wasn't sort of the lexicon that was used at that time. But he was a strong believer in that basic idea. So uh, in his many speeches, he gave hundreds and hundreds of speeches, especially in the 50s, but well into the 60s, commencement speeches, all kinds of speeches. Um, and while many of them had to do with the UN, uh, almost all of them, they often had a very strong component around um, issues of racial justice here. Uh, he would talk about two brands of democracy, for example, especially during the Cold War. We can't have an export style of democracy where we talk about what's needed, but we're not doing it at home. Um, and so, and he would talk about how we, as a multiracial society, were a symbol for the world. So that was something he believed in. So although he didn't use the language of diversity directly, he said many of the same things that we, I think, uh, see reflected in our discourse today around why this is a valuable, essential element. So yeah, he definitely agreed with that and I think would continue to, to make, that, make that case now. Um, he also often implored people, um, and he was particularly speaking to black audiences, to take a global perspective. This was a theme throughout his scholarship when he was at Howard as well as later that, um, and indirectly, I'm not sure, I'm trying to think of an example where he sort of implored people to join the Foreign Service or something like that. I don't know that he did that. I can't recall an example, but he implicitly said, we all need to think about the world. Like our issues at home relate to our issues abroad. And so we need to embrace that and take that seriously. Um, so I think he would have obviously supported uh, those efforts um, and he made that a part of his mission to go out and speak to diverse audiences whenever he could. Thanks so much. Um, it's been um, just a terrific discussion. I, I, um, I you know, we've we've only scratched the surface of this. I know we could, uh, you know, we've been here for about an hour and fifteen minutes, and um, I know from having read the book, um, there's so much more um, we could discuss. Fortunately for all of you, um, Oxford University Press has a solution to this dilemma. Um, I, I would encourage all of you, including those of you online. Uh, as an unpaid spokesman for this book, um, that uh, that you uh, secure a copy, however you can, um, so that you can um, you can appreciate the life of this really remarkable American and uh, and, and a courageous American too in uh, in so many ways. If I might say, the audio book was just released yesterday. So Fantastic. if you don't like to read, you can listen. That's right. <laughs> um, that's that's even better. Um, so anyway, Cal, uh, I want to thank you um, Thanks for, for, having me. for this. And, and I also want to thank um, Chris and Lise for providing their unique uh, perspectives um, from the fields in which they work. And then also thank all of you, uh, both here in person and online, for taking the time uh, to be with us today to engage in this conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having me.